The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15694 in the name of Jenny Gilruth on LGBT History Month. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Jenny Gilruth to open the debate. Ms Gilruth, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to lead this evening's members' debate on LGBT History Month. And it's also a privilege to do so in a parliament which Professor Andrew Reynolds of North Carolina University has described as the gayest parliament in the world. I'm also delighted to see that the Minister for Equalities, Christina McKelvey, will be responding this evening, someone who has always been a true ally of the LGBT community. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. George Orwell writing in the novel 1984. In the same year of the title of that book, Chris Smith, the Labour MP for Islington South and Finsbury, became the first openly gay Member of Parliament, 10 years after Maureen Colquhoun, the MP for Northampton North, came out as the first lesbian MP. The year before I started school in 1989, then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher introduced Section 28 of the Local Government Act. The Act stated that a local authority shall not intentionally promote homosexuality or published material with the intention of promoting homosexuality or promote the teaching in any maintained school of the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretended family relationship. And so it was to remain the case until the year 2000 when I turned 16. So for all but my final year at school, my teachers were told not to teach about being gay. They were not to promote it as being acceptable. Being gay was wrong and the system enshrined it in law. Thankfully, we live in more enlightened times now. Who would have thought back in the year 2000 that this parliament would back a law to create equal marriage or to support inclusive education in our schools, the absolute antithesis of section 28, or to pardon gay men and importantly apologize to them for ever being criminalized just because of who they loved. Undoubtedly, we live in better times. But as the prime minister braced herself for an impromptu game of pool with the Italian prime minister on Sunday night, I wonder if she paused for a thought to consider Mohamed al Getty, a TV presenter who was charged with promoting homosexuality, fined 3,000 Egyptian pounds and sent to prison for a year last month. Perhaps she had a glass of Prosecco after the TV cameras had left with the Italian Prime Minister. I wonder if Giuseppe Conte mentioned his Minister for Families, Lorenzo Fontana, who was against civil unions, passed by Italy in 2016 because he said, next time they will ask to marry dogs. But I am not convinced for our Prime Minister and her <coughs> commitment of the LGBT community because she has already led a government propped up by the DUP. Presiding officer, if the history of the LGBT community has taught us anything, from Margaret Thatcher to Theresa May, it is that our activism must continue. And that's why the theme of this year's LGBT History Month, Catalyst 50 Years of Activism, is so important. In my constituency, Glenrothes High School are the living embodiment of that activism. Staff in the school have been trained to raise awareness of LGBTI issues and its impact on pupils. They're celebrating LGBT History Month right now with displays, presentations around the school and within departments, subject-specific LGBT content is being taught. Added to that, pupils have been delivering assemblies on homophobic, biphobic trans and transphobic bullying. Things have definitely changed for the better in our schools. Ten years ago, I remember attending an in-service day in this city focused on discrimination in the classroom. And it was around about the time of the Stonewall campaign, Some People Are Gay, Get Over It. It was also not that long after the BBC Radio 1 presenter, Chris Moyles, had attracted controversy by describing a mobile phone ringtone as gay. He said, I don't want that ringtone, that's gay, live on air. Now, quite how a ringtone can have a sexuality, I remain unsure. Nonetheless, what Moyles' intervention did was to spark a debate about the use of the word gay pejoratively, something which was acceptable practice when I was at school and in the early days of my own teaching. Indeed, I was working in a profession who had been instructed in law not to discuss sexuality with pupils in any way, shape or form. They weren't used to calling it out and many didn't know that they could. That's why the work of the Thai campaign has been so transformational in Scotland schools over this parliamentary session alone. The Thai campaign achieved their campaign goal last November when the government um, fully accepted the recommendations of the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group. And throughout LGBT History Month, the Thai campaign have been championing LGBT icons every day in February. And one of those icons is a fellow Fifer and former para swimmer, swimming coach and triathlete, Stefan Hogan. Ahead of today's debate, he told me, LGBT History Month means so much to me because it is a way to celebrate the hard work and sacrifice our community has gone through in the past 
so that I can marry the man I love in the present. As a community, we need to celebrate this month to make sure that young people today know what our community had to go through a short 25 years ago. Stefan is right, we should celebrate. And almost exactly a month ago, I was delighted to host Fife's own Pink Salter in the Scottish Parliament at a reception to mark LGBT History Month. It was a particularly powerful event where people shared their personal stories of what LGBT History Month meant to them. A couple from Fife, a student from Dundee, a transgender woman. And all of them had fought battles, but all of them were activists. George Orwell told us that who controls the present controls the past. But the same writer also used the words Nancy and Pansy in his disdain for what he called the Pansy left and Nancy poets. I hope the Daily Record would not today print the headline Gay Sex Lessons for Scots Schools as they did in the year 2000. But the Daily Mail was more than happy to run with the warning Gay Rights Lessons in All Schools in November last year. Time has moved on, but ingrained prejudice remains. It might be 2019, but I still can't marry my girlfriend in the church I was brought up in. If I had a boyfriend, that love would be welcomed. LGBT History Month is about celebrating our history, but we should never seek to shy away from the darkness that history also tells us. From Section 28 to criminalising men just for who they loved, to a seamlessly harmless round of pool, the need to challenge homophobia, biphobia and transphobia has never been greater. Presiding officer, we should celebrate the lives of the LGBT icons who have lived and fought battles before our time, but we should also commit to that enduring legacy of activism and work to be the catalyst for LGBT equality every month of the year, remembering that we control the present. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Gillian Martin to follow by Annie Wells. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I want to thank my friend and colleague Jenny Gorruth for securing this debate, an issue that I feel pretty strongly about. The reason um, is I want to express my solidarity with people who feel erased from history, because history as written does not give voice to all the influencers and agents of change, and no group is more erased, I feel, than gay women. And I certainly would not claim any right to speak on their behalf, but rather I want to express my long-felt solidarity with gay women in particular, who I feel are woefully underrepresented in culture and history. I feel this about women in history in general, and if you think it's difficult to find key women who changed our world, then it's doubly difficult to find gay women who did so, because the history has just not been written by women or gay women. Stories of those catalysts need to be told and brought into the mainstream. And, and I use the phrase often when talking about women in elected positions, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Well, in the case of young women realising their sexuality, if you don't see it, you may think you have to hide it. But the mainstreaming of LGBT characters, specific films, television series, literature, recognising the sexuality of historic figures and the unearthing of the stories of LGBT figures in history is an epically important way of ensuring a society which does not discriminate and is a platform for ensuring our telling of history reaches a truth that includes every agent of change. And if the catalysts who bought fought for LGBT rights aren't agents of change, then who is? I want to use the rest of my time today to talk about the importance of cinema in rebalancing the gay women's erasure from history and reflecting history from the perspective of gay women. Um, I'm a former film uh, student, so forgive me, I'm indulging myself. But sa sadly, many of the films you've heard of detailing gay female relationships were directed by men. Uh, Blue is the warmest colour springs to mind, as, as does Carol, although based on the work of uh, lesbian Patricia Highsmith, it was directed by Todd Haynes. And English language films where the protagonist is a gay female of significance, well, I can only think of, of, of uh, well, I can't really think of many yet. There's one about the Queen Christina of Sweden um, in Swedish language, but surely there are great films to be made about Gladys Bentley or Tallulah Bankhead or many of the women in the suffragette movement who, who were gay. But there's so many great female uh, gay directors out there. Lisa Cholodenko, Kimberly Pierce, Lisa Gornick, Kanchi Witchman, uh, Cher uh, Cheryl Dunye. And we must not forget the work of the Scottish Queer International Film Festival in Scotland to showcase work by LGBT artists. We've watched television change from that momentous appointment viewing of the kiss between two women in Brookside in the 1980s to gay female characters being present in drama as almost as the norm. But 
Films about LGBT relationships are multiple and in many cases mainstream, but casting our attention backwards into history and retelling history with the airbrushing of female gay sexuality removed is vitally important if we're to get closer to a truth of what really happened. It needs to be in our cinemas, our living rooms, and as Jenny Gorruth has so eloquently said, in our classrooms. There needs to be a recognition that stories about gay women in history are as relevant as stories about white upper-class men in history. They are not of niche appeal. Just like hidden figures righted or wrong in the part African-American women made in the space race, I want to hear stories where gay women change the face of the earth. I want the gay women in my family to see something of themselves on screen, something of themselves that isn't just in core about struggle for acceptance, as important as that is, or the nature of sexual relationships, but also about how lead the, uh, women led the change and were protagonists of their own time. I want to end by thanking Jenny Gilruth again for giving me the opportunity to make my points on the importance of mainstreaming LGBT film and sticking my oar in as a sister and an ally, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Annie Wells to be followed by David Torrance. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and to Jenny Gilruth for bringing this topic to the Chamber this evening. It's always a huge privilege to speak in these debates celebrating LGBT History Month. <clears throat> and each year I am reminded of how far we have come from when I grew up in the 70s and 80s and how drastically the lives of LGB LGBT people have changed. LGBT History Month provides a perfect opportunity to celebrate this and to reflect on what comes next when it comes to activism. As Jenny Goldruth has covered, this is a significant year. The theme for 2019, Catalyst, 50 Years of Activism, activism marks 50 years since the Stonewall Uprising in New York City, which kick-started the equal rights movement for LGBTI people across the globe. 50 years of hard work and personal sacrifice by dedicated activists has resulted in a sea of change. We have seen equal marriage, the right to adopt, LGBTI inclusive education, and last year, the passing of the landmark Historical Pardons Bill. The lives of LGBTI people has, has changed imme immeasurably and with it, society's views. I know how proud I am to be in the LGBTI community, and I have spoken about it before. It was a, it was a real journey getting to this point. That is why I feel so strongly about the need to celebrate LGBT History Month and why I am encouraged by the level of activity in Scotland from Stornoway to Dumfries. As LGBT youth highlighted, popularity and awareness of this month is increasing quickly. There were 125 events listed this year. That's up 25% from 2018. And the dedicated Twitter account LGBT History Scott now has 10,000 followers. And in Glasgow, there have been many events marking the month. And it's not just individuals getting involved, it's communities, third sector organisations and businesses. Last week, the Gallery of Modern Art held a round table event to discuss future strategies for documenting and collecting objects that would increase the visibility of LGBTI history. And earlier this month, we saw the annual rainbow run, which unfortunately I was unable to take part in, but I will be doing it in 2020. Um, Glasgow's also hosted Leaps, Scotland's corporate temp and bowling tournament, giving businesses the opportunity to mark the month and show their support. These are just a few examples of the many events hosted, and I wish to put on record my thanks to everyone involved in organising them. As well as celebration, LGBT History Month provides an opportunity for addressing where our priorities should lie. LGBTI people are still affected by discrimination, prejudice, hate crime and social isolation. And in rural areas, areas particularly, there is still much more to be done in the way of progress. In 2015, 18% of the Scottish population still believed that sexual relations between two adults of the same sex is always wrong. And when it comes to trans rights, prejudice, prejudice is even more prevalent with little public awareness of what it's like to be a trans person. And in 2015, 32% of people said they would be unhappy if a close relative married or fo formed a long-term relationship with someone who'd undergone gender reassignment. So it's clear there is still some way to go. Using just politics as a marker, whilst inroads have been made with the representation of gay people in the Scottish Parliament, we are yet to see an openly trans or intersex politician in Scotland. 
And when it comes to the Gender Recognition Act, there still needs to be discussion in, in this place on reforming the process by which a person can change their legal gender without intrusive medical assessment. To finish today, Deputy President Officer, I would like again to give praise and wish every success to the LGBTI groups across Scotland organising events up and down the country. It is so important that LGBTI rights remain firmly on the agenda and in the Scottish Parliament, and I believe we can continue to work together to achieve positive, life-altering change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call David Torrance to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Mr Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank Jenny Galroof for bringing this motion to the Chamber today to raise awareness of LGBT History Month in Scotland. I would also like to thank LGBT Youth Scotland for coordinating this incredible nationwide event. Now in its 13th year, LGBT History Month is a fantastic opportunity to celebrate LGBT culture. We look back at LGBT history and look forward to the future of LGBT activism. As we have heard, this year's themed catalyst, 50 Years of Activism, marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprisings in New York in 1969 and the birth of the modern Pride movement. The Stonewall Riots were a decisive, era-defining moment in the struggle for LGBT equality and were a catalyst of the modern fight against LGBT oppression across the world. In the early hours of June 28, 1969, a gay bar in the West Village of Manhattan became the epicentre of an event that changed the course of LGBT history. One year later, on the first anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion in June 1970, the very first gay pride march was held in Manhattan. And since then, millions have attended LGBT pride marches, parades and festivals that have taken place all over the world. Fast forward 50 years and there has been undoubtedly been many great strides made in LGBT equality. We all know that Scotland has become a leader when it comes to LGBTI equality, and we are considered to be one of the most progressive countries in Europe. And Scotland has regularly been ranked as one of the best countries in Europe in relation to legal protections for LGBTI people. Last year, in a historic move, Scotland became the first country in the world to embed the teaching of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex rights in school curriculum. By teaching our children about sexual diversity, we can help to tackle discrimination and to promote acceptance towards different lifestyles. In Fife, we are extremely lucky to have many fantastic ambassadors of LGBT equality. I would like to take this opportunity to highlight the positive contributions of just a couple of these groups, Pink Saltire and the LBGT Plus group at Kirkcaldy High School. Since its formation in 2014, Pink Saltire has been an inspiration to the LGBT Plus community in Fife and wider Scotland. The team's commitment and dedication to breaking barriers and promoting equality and diversity is amazing. A couple of weeks ago, I visited their pop-up heritage hub at the Mercat Shopping Centre in Kirkcaldy and met with some of the team. The exhibition fe featured the most detailed LGBT history timeline ever produced in Scotland, with key fact facts and major highlights in the fight for equality, including the same-sex marriage and the abol abolition of discriminatory laws against gay and bisexual men. An event provided a real insight into the struggles faced through the years by the LGBT community and the bravery of activists throughout these years. Figures for a 2017-18 annual report showed an astonishing 1,350 hours of voluntary work and 13,626 miles travelled during the community work. From the inaugural Fife Pride to the positive engagements for community consultation across Scotland and continued development of our LGBT awareness training and support, Fife has a lot to thank them for, and I, for one, look forward to seeing what the future holds for them. The Kirkcaldy High School um, LGBT Plus Group was established to tackle negative attitudes, discrimination, and bullying across the school and to improve the mental health and life chances of LGBT Plus young people. The group meets weekly and comprises of those of identifying as LGBT Plus or as allies with an interest in equality and promoting human rights. In a relatively short time since their formation, they have very quickly become a leading group in the fight against discrimination and promotion of equality and are proud recipients of the COSLA in, Tackling Inequalities and Improving Health Award. One of our members, Cameron Bowie, was also named Young Volunteer at the 2018 Fife Volunteer Action Awards. Collectively, they have shown that they are a force to be reckoned with and show no signs of slowing down. It was great to see Purple Friday feature so heavily across social media last week. It was wonderful to see a level of engagement from all across Fife, from Kirkcaldy High School staff and the pupils to our fellow councillors. Individuals pledged their support for LGBTI equality and pledged their support to tackling homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. In conclusion, presiding officer, I welcome LGBT History Month and offer many thanks to LGBT Youth Scotland, its partners involved in the organisation for this year's events. 
Hustlers have undoubtedly been many great strides in the quality in the quality of the LGBT plus community will still face significant challenges and discrimination. Therefore, we must now allow ourselves to become complacent and we must continue to fight against discrimination and prejudice wherever and whenever we encounter it. And we must continue to stand up for equal rights. Thank you very much. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Ms Dugdale, please. Thank you, President Officer. And can I, first of all, thank you for calling me to speak, knowing that I have to leave the chamber immediately after my contribution, something which I advised you of uh, 24 hours ago. So I'm grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, can I say to Jenny Gilruth, um, congratulations on securing this debate and also on all the work that you have done uh, as a constituency MSP since your election. I know that your first event in the Parliament was for Pink Saltire and you've consistently um, hosted events and created opportunities for LGBT people to tell their stories and to talk about the campaigns that are forthcoming and I know that you will always continue to do that. President Officer, LGBT History Month is a celebration uh, of the journey that we've come uh, as a community and I would only reflect that when myself and Jenny Gorruth were outed as a couple about 18 months ago, people were far more interested in the difference in our politics than the fact that we uh, were of the same gender and in many ways that demonstrates how far we've come as a country. But the reality is there's still a, a lot of work to be done and I was reminded of that uh, when Jenny and myself uh, about a year ago travelled to New York to see firsthand uh, the Stonewall Inn because this of course as she mentioned is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots and the Stonewall Inn sits in St Christopher Street um, in downtown Manhattan and if you go there the first thing you'll pass on the uh, doorway into the bar is a big bold red sign from the New York Police Department which says raided premises the original sign from when they were invaded by the police all those years ago and inside the bar there are posters on the wall and Jenny will remember this well of the Gay Teachers Association um, sprayed with painted blood and it was of the gay teachers who marched in 1975 for equality 25 years before we would even consider section 2a and section 28 in this parliament the bravery that those teachers demonstrated then to march for equality long before many other countries had even faced up to the problems that we sought to address and it's in that note that I think it's also worth reflecting what's happening in our schools and Jenny Goruth did some of this in her opening remarks but when I was young you were lucky if LGBT young people were tolerated 10 years ago they were accepted now we're actively talking about them being included and I think that journey from tolerance to, exception, to acceptance to inclusion is one that we're now hoping that our trans uh, friends will be able to pass uh, along and journey-wise as well. And they should expect exactly the same tolerance, acceptance and inclusion that the LGB community had before then. But there's something else that's happening in our schools just now, and Jenny Gloris touched on this too. Whenever I've been in schools recently, I've seen the posters for the local school LGBT group. And I've thought about what the 15-year-old version of myself would have thought of that. And it just wouldn't have existed in the 90s uh, in my school, the idea that there was a group where LGBT kids could come together and talk about life. And just last week, I heard kids from Madras uh, High School talk very openly and casually about what it's like to be out at school. I couldn't have dreamt of being out at school. I didn't really know who I was when I was a teenager, but I knew I was different and I knew to keep my mouth shut. And there was one gay kid in my secondary school, everybody knew who he was, and he was tormented. And his life was a, a living hell during the passage of his school years. And I wonder where he is and how he is now. And I'm so very sorry that I didn't do more to stand up for him then. But I know collectively with others in this chamber, we're doing so much more to stand up for him and people like him now. And the thing is, keeping quiet isn't something that just happened 20 years ago. Some people are still doing it today. A recent Stonewall Scotland report told us that one third of people in Scotland still won't come out at work. And actually, I was one of them in this parliament for a long time. I was outed by a national newspaper. Many people knew I was gay, but I didn't openly talk about it. I wasn't in command of my own coming out story that was taken away from me. And Harvey Milk tells us that the most powerful or most political thing you can do is come out, but you need to be in a supportive environment to do that. And that wasn't something that I was able to do at the time. So people being in charge of telling their own stories is immensely important, and we must continue to create an environment where everyone can do that. 
Another problem that I've talked about in this chamber is, uh, frequently, presiding officer, is about LGBT young people and the homelessness that they experience. 40% of the young people that present as homeless in this city do so because they've had a negative experience of coming out at home. And that transcends all class barriers. It's working class kids, it's middle class kids, it's kids turning up in private school uniforms. So there's so much more that we can do to help all young people realise their potential. Just finally, and I appreciate I'm over my time, presiding officer, I'd like to say something very quickly to the Cabinet Secretary about the Gender Recognition Act, which is coming forth. I understand why the government have postponed this legislation, because they want to get it right. It's incredibly sensitive. But I think that you also need to understand that in creating that delay, you've created a vacuum. And in that vacuum, fear and ignorance is growing. And people's understanding of what these proposals actually are, what they will actually mean, is festering in a way that I think is unhelpful. And I know that the Cabinet Secretary probably uh, agrees with that. There's nothing contradictory between my feminism and my LGBT activism. Neither is a threat to the other. I know that, I'm comfortable with that, but I'm not the one that needs to be convinced. And there's so much more that we need to do collectively in this chamber. I'm sorry I won't be able to stay to hear the final speakers or indeed the summing up, but I endeavour to read all the contributions tomorrow and I'm grateful for the time. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I don't know whether the Minister will thank you for promoting her so publicly several times, but there it is. Uh, I, now, I now call Patrick Harvey, will be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, add my thanks to, to Jenny Gil Ruth, uh, as others have, as well as the organisations taking part in LGBT History Month? Um, Kez uh, Dugdale's excellent contribution there also touched on the, the anniversary of the Stonewall riots, which the, the motion mentions. I wanted to go back just a little bit before then because it was in 1957 uh, that the, the Wolfenden report recommended uh, the beginnings of decriminalisation of, of gay male sex uh, within the UK. Uh, and it was at that point that Scotland diverged. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, the most uh, notable Scottish voices on the Wolfenden committee, James Adair, uh, was uh, pretty vociferous in saying that he wouldn't support its recommendations. Uh, and uh, as a, a voice of the, the socially conservative religious establishment within Scotland, he was taken seriously. And that's probably one of the reasons why that partial decriminalisation, that beginning of decriminalisation, didn't happen in Scotland uh, until much later, legislation in 80. Uh, coming into force in 81, due in no small part to the efforts of Robin Cook, uh, who, uh, whose role, I think, is sometimes not recognised uh, this, uh, this long after those events. But he played a significant role in ensuring that Scotland did eventually see uh, that decriminalisation legislation. Why did it take that much longer? Why was there that delay in Scotland's story? Uh, it was partly due to social conservatism. I think more often due to the perception of social conservatism. Scotland had a story of itself which was of a more religious, more socially conservative society, uh, not just than we are now, but than the rest of the UK. And in the run-up to devolution, that perception was still there, and our community genuinely had anxieties. What would a Scottish Parliament do with our human rights, with our equality. We didn't know. As it happens, things have turned out better than some feared. And this is a parliament, sometimes been ahead of the curve, sometimes it's taken longer, but this is a parliament which still has never yet, in its 20 years of existence, never yet voted against our equality and human rights on any issue. I think that's a record to be proud of. Uh, and one to cherish. But that anxiety was there beforehand. We didn't really know. And then, of course, in the first session of the Scottish Parliament, we had the Section 2A campaign, Section 28, as it was commonly called. And uh, as members know, I was an LGBT youth worker in Glasgow at the time. I had to walk to work past billboards that said, protect our children. And that meant from people like me. Echoes in that nasty homophobic campaign uh, of Margaret Thatcher's speech in 1987 at her party conference when she complained that children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. This complaint, this complaint 
from a Prime Minister who elsewhere in the same speech had been complaining uh, that children were being taught such things as anti-racism as well. Uh, those were the traditional moral values she was trying to defend. And though that, that attitude echoed through uh, the rhetoric of, the, of the, the Keep the Clause campaign in our early years of this devolved parliament. Well, those values, the, the, the bigotry of Brian Souter and Thomas Winning were faced down at the time, and they were defeated on that issue, but those values didn't disappear. So have we moved on? How much have we moved on? As others have mentioned, the, uh, that um, daily record headline, gay sex license for so Scots schools, probably wouldn't be printed in the daily record now, but it's very little different than gay and trans lessons for primary schools, the headline that was printed in the Sunday Times just this weekend. One of the newspapers which has so cynically driven the vicious anti-trans backlash which is taking place at the moment. So these, these issues resonate and they echo through time. Telling the stories of our history, that's so important because it grounds us in, in who we are and where we've come from, but learning the lessons of history, that matters all the more. And what the lessons tell me from those few examples is that we must stand together. That's the only way we make progress. Those trying to separate the T from the LGBT will fail. We must stand up to them just as we stood up to those seeking to oppose our equality and human rights before. Because if they succeed in that, they won't stop at that. So we must ensure that we continue to stand together across the LGBT community, across women's and feminist organisations who support us as well, across the whole of our society, and I hope across the whole of our parliament. Thank you. Uh, before I call Emma Harper, because I've got several members still wishing to speak, I'm minded to take a motion without notice under 8.14.3, and I'd ask the member uh, leading the debate to move that motion. The motion has been moved. Is the Parliament agreed to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes? Thank you very much. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Finlay Carson, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this important debate this evening to welcome the, the 13th LGBT History Month with the theme catalyst 50 Years of Activism. I'd like to start by congratulating my friend and colleague Jenny Gilruth on securing this debate. And from the outset, I would like to note that Scotland is a world leader in promoting equality, inclusivity, fairness and respect. Jenny Gilruth has mentioned this with her comment that this is the gayest parliament. And uh, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has these values at the heart of all decision making, something I'm sure all of us in the Chamber are proud of. And in preparing for this debate, I reflected on some of the history of tackling LGBT discrimination in Scotland. And I think it's worth highlighting. In 2005, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender was made illegal. Then in 2009, equal rights were given to same-sex couples who were applying for adoption. And just last year, this parliament unanimously passed the Historial Se Historical Sexual Offences, Pardons and Disregards Scotland Act, which allows for gay people to be pardoned from historic convictions based on outdated legislation which targeted them just because of their sexual orientation. And more recently, Scotland has been regarded as the best country in Europe for LGBTI equality. And the Scottish Government's review of hate crime legislation was also welcome and I'm pleased that the Government is currently working to implement some of its key recommendations. Presiding Officer, I also reflected on the time I spent living and working in West Hollywood, Los Angeles during the 90s, a time when LGBT issues across America were very contentious. And members may recall that I led a debate in chamber last year to mark World AIDS Day, where I spoke about some of the stigma I witnessed whilst living and working in Los Angeles. Challenging the stigma and discrimination is so important. And I note that uh, the Thai campaign success that Jenny Gilruth has already mentioned. And I think it's fantastic to see that that work is going forward. In my South Scotland region, the LGBT community can sometimes struggle to access support because of the rurality of the region. And I welcome Annie Wells' comments regarding rurality, which is great coming from a Ouija. So we have several outstanding people working in the LGBT community. And I'd like to give a shout out to Jonathan Gallagher, Ian Campbell and Alice Pooley from Dumfries and Galloway LGBT Plus 
They know the struggles that people in our rural communities face and they keep me up to date with their vital work to support people and tackle homophobia and transphobia with support from, with support, um, from other agencies around us. And for me, I have uh, contacted the Scottish Horticultural Society with support from a local couple around LGBT discussions. Um, the Scottish Hort Horticultural Society have agreed to take part in an LGBT event and photo op at the Royal Highland Show this year to support um, LGBT issues in the horticultural sector. So again, I would like to congratulate Jenny Gilruth on bringing this important debate to chamber and I reaffirm my support for the progress this parliament has made in bringing about equality for all across the LGBT community while also stressing the need for further action to be taken, particularly in our rural areas, to continue to make Scotland the fairest and most progressive country it can be. And I love Kezia Dugdale's words, tolerance, acceptance and inclusion. These are perfect words to take this work forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Finlay Carson, we followed by Gail Ross. Ms Ross will be the last speaker in the open debate. Thank Mr. you, Deputy Carson. Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank Jenny Galruth for bringing this important debate to the Chamber this evening. I believe it's important that we continue to mark LGBT History Month. And in my contribution, I'd like to focus on the contribution organisations and groups based in Dumfries and Galloway, a huge, hugely rural area where delivery of support can be much less straightforward than in more populated areas. It also represents an opportunity for us to talk about where more work can be done to support the LGBT community, as we all strive for equality in all quarters of society. Although, as other members, including Kezia Dugdale, have noted, with regards to LGBT, there have been great strides across the globe. In rural uh, constituencies like my own of Galloway and West and Fries, ensuring equity and equality is more difficult to achieve, no matter what the issue, whether it be health, education, or social inclusion, and that's putting aside the historic barriers and prejudices facing our LGBT communities. There are issues in delivering equity and quality, not purely in terms of resources and support for organisations, but for reaching out to the individuals who may live at the end of a farm road or in a rural village. That's why I was extremely pleased during this month to see positive th things happening in uh, Dumfries and Galloway, uh, with the Dumfries and Galloway LGBT Plus receiving £120,000 from the National Lottery Community Fund, which will be used over the next three years. This six-figure sum will be used by the group to offer support and to ease iso uh, rural isolation and rural uh, communities through a range of different social activities. The importance of this funding uh, to the group uh, was quite tangible when the, the service manager, Ian Campbell, said that upon announcing the funding, there was quite a few of the members just uh, burst into tears. And he stated that we don't want to, uh, people to travel to us we want to travel to them. So providing the resource to do that across rural areas like Galloway and Western Fries can only send out a positive message to the LGBT community. I know that Dumfries and Galloway LGBT plus recognize the issues relating uh, to uh, the, the issues we have and the identities um, and the issues affect more than just individuals themselves, but also their friends and families and colleagues. So they offer many different types of support across the region, including one-to-one -one support, advocacy, befriending, specific transgender support, uh, regional drop-ins, as well as a whole range of other services. And, and during the summer, they get out into their field, quite literally, at the agricultural shows, where I know they're very warmly welcomed by the farming community. As other members have noted, including my colleague Annie Wells, there's been a welcome rise in the number of events taking place in the local areas across this month in particular. And in Dumfries, I was also pleased to see the renowned group Lavender Menace and local artist group We Agree With Eggs run a queer pop-up library in the heart of uh, Dumfries in the High Street over the weekend past. And there was a whole host of other free events on offer this weekend from simply just providing a cup of tea and chats to workshops and also a human library which gave LGBT people the chance to tell their own life experiences of living in the area. And I hope that these sort of events and more can take place, yep, importantly during this month, but also all year round. And only on Sunday there was a speculation regarding the potential LGBT use of one of Dumfries' iconic buildings. 
The church in the High Street has stood for over 150 years, but numbers uh, have continued to dwindle, unfortunately. But now they're looking for a funding package to put together for the possibility of LGBT-friendly housing at the site, particularly for older people with the aim of creating more town centre housing. This is an idea which had been totally unthinkable a few decades ago, or even a few years ago, never mind in the 1860s when the church was first constructed. When we are linking other major issues such as ensuring good quality housing in our town centres alongside LGBT support, then there could be no doubt we've made significant progress. Indeed, after only a few months after my election in 2016, I was delighted to pay a visit alongside other politicians to Relationship Scotland's premises in Dumfries after they were awarded a Silver Charter Award by LGBT Youth Scotland. They made uh, and carried out extensive engagement with the, uh, the local community and commemorated a number of LGBT events throughout the year, uh, just to name a, a couple of things of why they achieved the charter. There's a lot of great work being done across Dumfries and Galloway and indeed Scotland, so that's why it's so pleasing to hear from so many other members tonight highlighting the success in their own areas. We've many, many disagreements in this chamber, but on this subject we can all play our part to support LGBT community and then the future will be, no doubt, very positive. Thank you very much. And I call Gail Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I would like to begin by thanking my good friend and colleague, Jenny Goroof, for bringing this timely and very important members' debate to the Chamber of the Scottish Parliament. And I would like to also congratulate her on a truly brilliant spe speech. Um, I would also like to thank everyone that got in touch with material and briefing for today's debate, in particular LGBT Youth Scotland, and I would thoroughly recommend their Twitter account and website to see some of the fantastic work that they are doing. Many have mentioned the great work that we have done and are doing in this parliament, and I'm a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, and we pride ourselves on furthering equalities and human rights for everyone. And um, I'd just like to mention uh, the Minister, Christina McKelvey, our past convener, who's sitting in front of me and is going to uh, reply to this debate, because a lot of the work that we are doing and have done is down to her and her commitment to this cause. And through our work, we have heard some worrying examples of discrimination and stereotyping, but we've also heard lots of fantastic work that is going on as well. Now, one of the core values of LGBT History Month is to focus national attention on the LGBTI community and enhance LGBTI equality at a local and national level. And being from a huge rural constituency, I'm acutely aware that a lot of the attitudes towards the LGBT community in some areas haven't really changed over the years. We still have a lot of work to do to make sure that people, especially our young people, are supported. In fact, LGBT Youth Scotland have done a lot of research in this area, and I would like to quote from a couple of the paragraphs of their parliamentary briefing. It tells us that increasing numbers of LGBT young people in Scotland think it's a good place to live. 81% of respondents to the Life in Scotland survey said this in 2017, compared to just 57% in 2016. However, there is a notable difference from respondents in rural and urban areas across a number of relevant policy areas, such as transport, education, and isolation. LGBT young people are at risk of social isolation when there are limited socialization opportunities available to them, or when discrimination stops them from seeking or accessing opportunities. And there is also some evidence to suggest that young people who experience social isolation are more likely to experience poor mental health Expendable income can also play a role in an individual's ability to access, access certain socialisation opportunities, particularly when the only available social, socialisation takes place in commercial venues or when a significant amount of travel is required. It's also clear that LGBT young people can have reduced social networks if family or friends reacted negatively to them coming out. LGBT young people may face homelessness as a result of coming out to a parent or carer or feel as though they need to leave home in order to avoid discrimination. For example, 22% of transgender young people who responded to the survey left home under negative circumstances and often commented that this was typically due to how their family reacted to their status. 
And it goes on to say, as a result of a lack of access to safe spaces, young people will often need to use public transport to access services such as LGBT youth work. However, research shows that while 67% of lesbian, gay and bisexual young people said they felt safe on public transport, this is not the case for transgender young people for whom only 51% felt safe. Presiding officer, so in conclusion, LGBT History Month celebrates, raises awareness and calls out inequality. But inequality exists not only within our society, but also geographically as well. And LGBT Youth Scotland capture it perfectly when they say, it is important that young people across Scotland have access to the same support and resources in order to ensure they are adequately supported. This will help build resilient and welcoming rural communities which are open and welcoming to LGBTI people. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Christina McKelvey to close for the Government mm -hmm. Minister, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Jenny Gilruth for bringing uh, this debate to the Chamber and to also thank all the members for their amazing contributions. But can I just say to Jenny Gilruth, you are a true champion. And Gillian uh, um, and uh, Martin and her um, remarks said that you can't be what you can't see. And I think many, many young women and young men looking at you leading this debate today can see what they can be. And that's a great thing to be proud of. So well, well, well done. Presiding officer, I also had the privilege of attending Pink Salt Tires at Parliamentary Reception. It was a fantastic event. It celebrated LGBT History Month. We heard many, many personal stories from individuals and many were highlighted by, uh, by all of us uh, in how uh, they worked incredibly hard for the equality and progressing uh, that equality in the LGBT community. From um, the, the couple from Fife who spoke about their personal experiences, from the young purple dragon from Dundee who is a young person person talk about, talked about her experiences and from the very deep emotional and honest speech uh, from a, a trans woman called Stevie Maybanks. Absolutely amazing speeches from them all, all from different perspectives but all saying the same thing. We have made progress but we have much, much more to do. So it's hugely important that we celebrate um, LGBT History Month to acknowledge the challenges that people have faced to understand the impact of each and every, uh, every contribution. And each and every contribution at that event, I can't overstate it how uh, moving it was, but it also took us that step forward to eradicating that discrimination, eradicating that prejudice, and actually creating that equal uh, um, world that we want to see for LGBT people. To see so many of the daily media posts from schools, from workplaces, from communities, yes, even from politicians all sporting our purple on Purple Friday, celebrating, commemorating, and most importantly, educating, being those catalysts for change that we all want to see has been an absolute joy. And to see my friends in the Thai campaign's daily icon, which has been enlightening education for me, but we have one of these every single day of LGBT History Month, and it just demonstrates very clearly that people that came before us, the people who have fought those battles, and how we have to take up those battles and continue to fight on. But let's hope that the battles that we fight are not big battles anymore, they're only small ones, then we can push away all of that discrimination. Presiding officer, this government recognises the discrimination of gay, lesbian and bisexual and trans people face every day of their lives for no other reason than being who they are, just themselves, and they're trying to just be true to who they are uh, themselves. And that, for me, epitomises why we need to celebrate LGBT History Month, a series of events to recognise the struggles people before us have faced and are still facing today, to mark the progress that has been made and to proudly state that who we are regardless of our sexual orientation or gender identity and that no one will change that that's very very important and as I mentioned as mentioned by others in the chamber this year's theme is catalyst 50 years of activism it marks 50th anniversary of Stonewall, Stonewall uprisings in New York in 1969 which was pivotal uh, a very pivotal moment in the pride movement but LGBT History Month is not only about LGBT people standing up for their rights. The power of allies and role models in this respect should not be underestimated, and we've heard from many of them today. There is no greater ally for LGBT
LGBT equality than this parliament. And I'd like to say this government, and Patrick Harvey reminded us that we should be rightly proud of that. And we should be, we still have work to do though. But this parliament, which overwhelmingly voted in favour of legalising same-sex marriage, a great day, I was here, it was wonderful. A parliament that legislated to allow pardons and disregards for gay men convicted of same-sex activity, which would now not be considered uh, illegal. And importantly, an apology from this government to those men who committed no more than to love who they loved. This government is absolutely committed to reviewing and reforming gender recognition legislation to improve the lives and experience of trans people in Scotland. And I hear the calls from many that we have to ensure we get this right. And we're working very closely with everyone we can to, uh, to get that absolutely right. This government is committed to reforming hate crime legislation, where we heard some uh, um, comments about that earlier. Emma Harper reminded us um, that, that we've got this bit of work to do and we, we have to get on with it and get it right as well. Uh, Emma also told us, very interestingly, because it's very diverse in these debates, of always we get wonderful things coming from, about a horticultural project and the Royal Highlands show. I'm sure all of the rural people in here, maybe not so much rural people, would be interested in hearing that. But I wanted to comment uh, uh, briefly on some of the comments from uh, other speakers in the debate. Jenny Gilruther reminded us how far we have come and that, that, that from the times of section 28. She reminded us about Glen Rother's high school and that all schools approach but I was a wee bit worried presiding officer when Jenny was making her remarks about marrying her girlfriend in the church that she wants to. I thought we were hearing a proposal for, for today and I was like already picked my hat out but you know and, and, and she's off. Um, so <laughs> but uh, she, she, she reminded us about how important that is, of these wee things that make you the person that you are and how important they are. Gillian Martin reminded us about the intersectionality and the issue about gay women and politics influencers, telling us that, that hist of that history, that truth is agents of change in our cinemas, in our living rooms and in our schools. And being what you seeing what you can be is incredibly important. Annie Wells also talked about the community approach to LGBT History Month, the Rainbow Run I'll be sponsoring her if she's running in that because I'm, I might just go and run behind her for a bit of a laugh. But um, I think it's great when people commit themselves to doing things and we're all going to watch Annie running in the Rainbow Run, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Um, uh, David uh, Torrance reminded us about the vibrancy of the Pride movement, that education changes cultures, and he knows that from Kirkcaldy High School. I know that from Kirkcaldy High School because we have heard from him in this place. But he warns us against complacency, which leads me on to Kezia Dugdale's remarks and, and a reminder about the story wall in about the posters of raided premises of blood daubed posters for the gay teachers about the fact that tolerance acceptance to inclusion is the route that we should be taking and reminding us that people were tormented and that people we know are tormented and how do we create the environment where people can tell their own story and Patrick told us to learn the lessons of history and that's why history month is so important Emma Harper, Finlay Carson and Gail Ross reminded us about the challenges of being in rural communities and how areas uh, are, are working very closely to, to make the difference. It looks like there's loads going on in Dumfries and Galloway, so we might have to come for a visit, especially um, I'd be interested in my old adults minister's hat on about the LGBT housing and Gail Ross recalled about the fantastic fantastic work of LGBT Youth Scotland and everything that they do. Presiding officer, these achievements have meant that Scotland is recognised as one of the most progressive countries in Europe for LGBTI equality and human rights. But the truth is that this pro process progress sorry would not have been made had it not been for the tireless work of the organizations and activists some of whom who i will expect will be watching who have sought day and night to advance equality for lgbt people in scotland we thank them we thank them deeply for their activism and their work the government so open dialogue with LGBTI organisations has been, has been vital in informing our approach to policy, a policy that we will continue uh, to work on and that engagement with those organisations will always continue to be the case as we work on eliminating inequalities that continue to exist in society so that anyone who is L, G, B, T or I is empowered to fill their fulfil their potential in our Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.